And I'll take all uh, nine and a half of them. Um, it goes, by the way, if drunk with sight of power, we loose L O O S E, wild tongues that have not thee in awe, such boastings as the Gentiles use, and lesser breeds without the law. Uh, the, the, it's the whole magnificence of Kipling that is exactly what makes people nervous about quoting him correctly. Because when you get it right, it's unsettling. And lots of things about this are unsettling, and so they should be. And it's uh, my duty, as well as my pleasure, to congratulate Peter on, on keeping things edgy for this evening. You didn't come here, we hope, for a banal debate, ladies and gentlemen. Um, now listen, uh, you can't see underneath my shirt the garlic uh, necklace. <laughs> and you have no idea that I'm fighting my way by Northwest Airlines back from here tomorrow morning to be in New York for the uh, memorial service for William F. Buckley at St. Patrick's Cathedral. In other words, you've got no idea what I've been going through lately and there's no real reason why you should. Uh, but when they said to me this evening, when you come out, do you want to be at the throne or at the pulpit? I did feel slightly uh, discombobulated. <laughs> and when I said, well, where's the men's room? And they said, it's down there. And there's men's room, and then there's women's room. I understand that bit. And in between, Sexton's room. I began to feel more discombobulated still. Um, and today is the anniversary of the day in 1945 when my mother and my father got married, after both of them having been through a very long war very long, brutal, cruel war after that succeeded the long austerity, poverty, struggle with which they'd had to beguile their youth in the 1920s and 30s of interwar Britain, if you can even assume that people in Europe in those days lived between two wars rather than endured a long armistice between two terrifying resumptions of hostilities. Every time you read fragile truths in the New York Times, think of that as applying to the 1920s and 1930s in Europe, and you'll get a better idea of what those resumption of hostilities were. And yes, I think if I look at my brother and think, well, our parents got married in this day, 1945, that is a little unsettling. It's also, I think, hope you don't mind my saying so, rather reassuring. We are both here, after all, and determined to testify. Now, on this question about the Mesopotamian War, um, <laughs> everybody knows why they oppose it, don't they? Everyone's clear on what their reasons are. Um, we were told uh, wrong things. We were given inaccurate information by dubious governments. We were sort of cheated into a, a feeling that we uh, our... Uh, Delegations of the UN uh, had overstated the matter of weapons of mass destruction and terrorism. In fact, when you think about it, um, you'll find that it's probably even wrong to mention Saddam Hussein in the same breath as weapons of mass destruction or terrorism. I have a couple of tests from, of my own for whether people know what they're talking about when they're talking about Iraq. Anyone who says that Saddam Hussein was, okay, a bad guy, doesn't know what they're talking about. You hear that said quite a lot. They don't know. They don't know what fascism feels like. They don't know what it's like to see families forced at gunpoint to applaud the torture and execution in public of their family members. They don't know what it's like to see 180,000 members of the Kurdish people at a minimum killed by poison gas in the northern provinces of Iraq. They don't know what it's like to see at least that number of uh, Shia Arabs killed in southern Iraq. They don't know what it took Anglo-American, British-American policy to put a no-fly zone from 1991 onwards over those two zones to make sure that those two genocides could not be replicated. They don't know what it would be like to be a citizen of Kuwait or Iran seeing Saddam Hussein's army coming over the horizon, attacking your civilians in that way, abolishing, in one case, 
the whole existence of a member state of the Arab League and of the uh, Muslim, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the Islamic Conference and of the United Nations, abolishing it, annexing it, making it part of Iraq. They, don't, they didn't hear the speech from Saddam Hussein saying the only mistake he ever made was that he invaded Kuwait before he'd finished the nuclear weapon. He should have done it the other way around. First get the nuclear weapon that at the Chuwaitha uh, reactor which we found uh, as a result of the Kuwait war when we weren't looking for it. Get the bomb first, then invade Kuwait, then ask them what they're going to do now, now that I've invaded it. Don't do it, don't get it the wrong way around. We lived at this man's permission for a long time. We lived by his warrant. Only his stupidity allowed us uh, to be uh, as complacent as we were. And in the meantime, uh, fighters in northern and southern Iraq were fighting against a tyrant who we should have been fighting ourselves. The liberation of Iraq, in other words, the decision that we had to move the Iraqi people and the region into a post-Saddam era, will stand, I'm convinced, as one of the greatest decisions of American statecraft, as one of the things that American soldiers, male and female, and politicians who voted for it, those who have defended it, will be proudest of in the future of any decision we've ever made. Despite the ridicule, despite the incompetence, despite the failures, despite the disappointments, let us review what we've done. First, we have removed a keystone state of the Middle East from the control and sole ownership of a psychopathic crime family who owned all of Iraq and treated its people as if they were disposable citizens. I remind you that this keystone state occupies a choke point on the Gulf and an arterial carotid point in the world economy that cannot be left to the control of a fascistic mafia. I remind you further that it exists between the uh, exorbitant uh, Sunni Wahhabi theocracy of Saudi Arabia and the no less exorbitant Shia theocracy of Iran, that it is it is the keystone that allows us, yes us, we who have the right to do this, we who have the right to insist on oil, we who don't have to be ashamed of mentioning oil in the same breath as democracy, to say, if we can recuperate Iraq, if we can recuperate its oil industry, if we can stop it being the private property of a psychopathic crime family, we can not only help the Iraqis, but we can undercut the monopoly or the duopoly of Shia Iran and Wahhabi Saudi Arabia. Does anyone think this is a matter of indifference? Or is anyone willing to get up and say, you sir, very good for you. I admire your nerve. I wouldn't mind if you were the only one as you seem to be. You're indifferent to it. Um, the rest of us here, voters and consumers, all believers in uh, freedom, uh, might possibly want to take the view that it can't be for us a nothing question what happens to Iraq. We'll add in the remaining time, that we have brought one of the great uh, war criminals of the world to justice and put him and his prime family and his main uh, complicit associates on trial in public in a country where, until recently, very recently, it was death, slow death, very slow death, to possess a cell phone or a satellite dish. That we have undone what UNESCO calls the greatest crime against the human ecology ever committed, the destruction of the marshes of uh, southern Iraq, the oldest wetlands in the Middle East, the smoke and destruction of which could be seen from the space shuttle, so terrible was the uh, environmental decay. That we have uh, proclaimed uh, the autonomy of the Kurdish people, the oldest uh, and largest uh, nation in the world not to have a state of their own and that where they live in their federalized, uh, democratized provinces in northern Iraq which were released from Saddam Hussein's control uh, a full 12 years before the liberation of the rest of the country, uh, business flourishes, uh, press flourishes, democracy flourishes, civil society flourishes. The sooner, the earlier the intervention by the British and American forces in Iraq, in other words, the happier, the sooner, the greater, the deeper, the more enduring, and the more useful in the future. 
is the outcome. Um, I'm willing to defend, because I've just seen time, I'm willing to defend and underline and repeat and restate and emphasize everything I have said so far. So all of you who've come here under the pathetic illusions peddled by Hillary Clinton, Harry Reid and MoveOn.org have all your work still ahead of you. And you thought it was going to be easy, didn't you? Bye now.